What's up, everybody? Matt Perino here, NYUpSyracuse.com. We got a fun Instagram live today. We're going to go live with Rico from Buffalo Fanatics because I got to thinking, we're, we're going to, 10 days from training camp, we're about to start talking everything Buffalo Bills football in these next two weeks, and I wanted to get somebody on here to talk about things from a fan's perspective. What's going through the mind of the Bills fan Right now, as we head into a very important training camp, an anticipated training camp, uh, over at the site, nyupsyracuse.com, uh, while we wait for uh, Rico here to join us uh, on IG Live, uh, you can check out our season previews, uh, or training camp previews, I should say, as we go through each position group, kind of break down everything uh, that, we go, uh, that we got going into camp, and... Uh, I see Pierre from uh, Buffalo Fanatics is in here. Uh, thank you for joining us, and thank you for allowing Rico to join us as well. Uh, I want to take your your comments, your questions, uh, anything that you want to uh, participate uh, today in the in the chat. We're going to talk about a couple uh, plan topics, and we want to talk about anything that you guys got uh, as well. Uh, it looks like we got Rico. We can get him in here. Representing uh, Horns Up, UB Bulls on the show today. What's up, Rico? How are you, my man? Matt Perino, what's good? What's happening, man? Not much, man. I'm excited to have you uh, on IG here. You guys do a great job over at Buffalo Fanatics. Uh, a lot of activity this off seasons. I saw your interview with Deion Dawkins was awesome, and you do a great job. So I said, hey, let's link up. Let's, let's get on IG Live. Talk a little Buffalo Bills football because you're passionate about it. And obviously, yes. this is what I do, 365. Uh, very passionate about it as well. How you doing? Man, I, I appreciate you. I appreciate you uh, kind of uh, um, hit me up, man. This is actually exciting to do this because, like, it's it's always good to interact and collab with Bills fans, man. Too much too much silliness happens outside. So when it's nice collab, you get to talk Bills and it's just fun. It's This is, this is what I like. This is great. Thanks for having me. Exactly, and I think you bring up a great point. So a lot of times in sports, it gets a little bit stuffy. It gets a little bit, uh, you know, too too professional, too you know, wrapped up and presented with yeah. a bow. I like to have fun. I like to you know, kind of change it up a little bit. And you guys are doing great work on there, and I want to shine some spotlight on it. But you know, I have a couple things I want to get into you, with you today. Uh, big yes, season, a lot of expectations. But I want to start off with, and let me just say. We got it popping in here. There's a lot of people already. Uh, let yes, us know your good. comments, questions, whatever you guys want. Uh, let us go. Uh, let us know. Uh, but I wanted to start off with the expectations. And one of the big things going into this year is I think even from a media perspective, there is a heightened sense of expectations. I do uh, locally. Jerry Sullivan, who's known for his saltiness uh, mm -hmm. over, over the years. He's putting the expectations, and I think this is a good barometer, at 10 wins for this team. And with those expectations come, um, what's, the good, what's the word I'm looking for? With the expectations comes a little trepidation. You wonder, okay. when do you get to that point where things are maybe going not the way you had hoped, where you start to push the panic button? And what happens in a season with such high expectations, not only for the team but with Josh Allen, if things don't go according to plan, especially early when the schedule is a little bit easier. Listen, man, I, I'm with Sullivan. Um, I mean, a lot of people are, are against Sullivan's type uh, of, of, of critique on the mm -hmm. Bills, but sometimes you have to be. When, you've, when you're when you part of a franchise that doesn't have, uh, uh, um, in the last 20 years, um, a lot of good things to talk about, yeah, and, and you put a lot of work this offseason, yes, there's got to be high expectations. And, yes, we are a 10-win team. Anything below 10 is a disappointment. That is my opinion and a lot of opinion of a lot of people. A lot of people are sitting there all, also okay with Vegas' six wins and seven wins. Um, I feel a lot of that is because people don't want to get their hopes up. They don't want to get their hopes up too high, right? There's that trepidation. There's that, there's that, uh, let me hold back a little bit because I want to see what this team is about. But 10 wins is a must. We must. This is a playoff year. The schedule is favorable. So we should be able to uh, at least rack up six wins in our sleep. Six wins in our sleep. And we got the rest of the season to kind of build on it, right? Everyone knows the season starts off slow. 
starts off slow. You start. You're still trying to gel. You're still trying to get used to your new teammates. But with the defense coming back as a top five defense, with the additions we've made to this team, I can't see why we can't be ten wins. Mr. Sullivan is correct on this matter. Mm -hmm. You know, it, it's going to be interesting to see how things mesh early on. That's one of the things that I'm most excited about training camp is seeing how some of these offensive line position battles shake out, how some of these skill positions, what are they going to do at wide receiver? Who's going to be, you know, in that starting lineup? You figure that Cole Beasley is going to be in the slot. But the biggest question I have is who's going to be making plays from the tight end position? Uh, I was able to see up close and personal at minicamp uh, and OTAs, Dawson Knox, third-round draft pick, really stood out without pads on. A nice little caveat there to remember Absolutely. there's a lot to go there. But, you know, from a tight end perspective, what's got you excited? Here, here's the deal. With the tight end position, it's, it's, it's a shaky one because um, you, you go back and, and look at the tight ends that we've had in the past. Um, and, you know, your Jay Reamers, Muzz, uh, you've, you've had uh, your, your Robert Royales, uh, of the world. So, like you go back and, and look at the tight ends we've had and we've we've never had like dynamic dynamic tight ends i mean uh i mean we got uh charles clay was one of the i, I really like charles clay and I, I expected big things for charles clay but that knee hampered him so we had to now go young um jason Kroom, i'm not sleeping on i'm not sleeping on jason Kroom yet right a, a converted receiver to tight end he's put in the work he's working on his pass blocking he's working on his ability to play tight end but We've now padded the room now, so it makes it a lot. It, it makes it a, a lot more competitive in the room. But Dosic Knox coming through, uh, Tommy Sweeney um, making a little noise as well. But Dosic Knox seems to have uh, a stronghold because J Croft's injury, uh, which we knew potentially could happen, that's why they created and put his contract that way. Uh, stay on the field, you get paid, right? So off the field, you're not. And this is exactly what's happening. So am I excited for this tight end position? Yes, uh, but I need to see more. Like you said. No pads. Mm -hmm. That means a lot. So once the pads go on, uh, I'm, I'm looking forward to seeing uh, a little bit of Knox. Uh, Lee Smith. Lee Smith is Lee Smith. Uh, but Jason Kroom, I'm not sleeping on Jason Kroom, man. I can't. I just can't. You go back and watch some of the highlights from last season, or some of the game tape, and, and Jason Kroom played well in, in spurts last year. And I think that that you know, is a big reason why he's still on this roster. They purged that position over the course of the offseason. Logan Thomas, Absolutely. Charles Clay no longer here. Uh, and I think one of the questions in the chat was, you know, do you think Ty Tyler Croft's going to be ready to rock by week one? I'm not so sure. I mean, the projections for the injury have him slated to be ready to go uh, by the time week one rolls around. But you got to figure there's going to be a rehab. It, this is his first year with the Bills. It's going to take some time for him to get comfortable with the playbook, with his teammates, with Josh Allen and Dawson Knox, Tommy Sweeney. Uh, Jason Kroon, who's already got the you know the one year under his belt in this system, they're all going to be ahead of the game when you get to that week one. You're absolutely right, and 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 here's the thing. Remember when uh, Sammy Watkins with his foot injury, right? Uh, he's going to be ready for X time, and then he gets in the game, but you just never know. You plant your feet, you do things differently, you plant on like when it's game time speed, things change, right? You got to rehab it, you got to go through practice, you're trying to go as hard as you can, but once the game starts. Different atmosphere. I mean, look at Kevin Durant. Just to give you kind of an example, he practice. He made sure that he was good to go. Gets in the game. One just one plant. You're you're done. So, uh, is he ready for week one? I don't think so. But even though he is ready for week one, he's got to now supplant Dawson Knox. Dawson Knox is getting all this playing time. He's got to plant Jason Kroon that's going to be getting all this chemistry with with the quarterback. So, not only that, if you're not on the field, I mean, you're you got to be available. If you're not available, my friend, you can't help. That's the way exact. That's the way I look at it. But here's my question for you, though. You're talking about tight ends. You're talking about receivers. Uh, you mentioned Cole Beasley, um, and we've got that that receiver. That receiver room is is uh, is congested, if if you will. Um, we already know, and I I call it the core four. You know what I'm saying? You got your Zay Jones, you got your Robert Foster, you got your Cole Beasley, you got your John Brown, right? Everybody got paid. Those two guys got paid. Then you got the fifth spot, which is going to be our return specialist, our pro bowler. Then you got receiver six. And it's and you got David Sills, Duke, Isaiah McKenzie. Some people are even saying Cam Phillips is probably part. Well, how do you feel about that receiver room? I have to I have to throw that into you. I want I want to see your opinion. I want to get your opinion. I, I really like, you know, David Sills' story. And I think, you know, I got to talk to him at, at mini camp and he seems like 
you know, he's got his head on right. He's, he's, he's in here to work hard, but, you know, he's behind the eight ball. I mean, coming in here as a rookie, you're going up against guys like Duke Williams, who has professional experience, who's bringing, you know, a last chance type of mentality into Buffalo. I, I really like the time I've gotten to talk to him. It seems like he's approaching this opportunity the right way. And what he brings to the table, none of these other receivers really bring. Physicality, some size, uh, it, a willingness to kind of get into uh, contested catch situations and mix it up a little bit. And I haven't seen a lot of that from the rest of this receiving crew, which I put him kind of at an advantage there. I don't think you can discount what Isaiah McKenzie did in 2018. I think he had a nice season. Uh, There were some moments where he probably liked to, as Sean McDermott would like to have a few of those moments back. But, you know, that was his first real – he was thrust into a very big, prominent position. Josh Allen was targeting him – six, seven, eight times a game. And that's a big jump from going from the Denver practice squad at the beginning of the year to a significant contributor at the end of the year. You still have Ray Ray McLeod. I, was, I put out the receiver preview today. The kid's only 22 years old. Don't sleep on Ray Ray. He's, he, he's got everything figured out, I think, from a mental perspective. He's very close with Chad Hall. He really uh, credits him for a lot of his development, maturity. But now we'll see. But the point I'm making is, do I project Ray Ray McLeod to make this team? No, but I think he can be a thorn in the side of a couple of these guys that want to make it because Brandon Bean drafted him and because he's still so young. Here's the thing. Brandon Bean drafted him means nothing to me because, and I'll, and I'll tell you why. Brett, and I, I, I applaud Brandon Bean for this because he's, he's big enough to make moves but also know that if he made a mistake, he'll get rid of it as well. So, yes, he drafted Ray Ray McLeod, which I, I really wanted a really big role for Ray Ray McLeod. I really did. But the minute Isaiah McKenzie showed up, Ray Ray McLeod shrunk. So him, he, he has to have a huge offseason. But guess what? McKenzie ain't letting this opportunity go. He knows uh, this room is tight. So he's got to do everything possible uh, that he can to get in. Now, Cole Beasley kind of throws things off a little bit. Uh, because like he's going to be thrust into the start into the, the into the starting position, he's going to be on the field a lot. Um, but Mackenzie, Ray Ray, that they cancel each other out, man. One's going to cancel the other out, and then it's really going to be between Sills, Duke, Mackenzie. I think it's just going to be those three guys, and maybe we open it up to seven receiver spots instead of six. Is that a possibility? I, I projected that. I th- I thought that Isaiah and Duke are going to make the final roster just because my of- man. You know, I think Duke Williams, because of that physicality, can play some special teams. Uh, McKenzie could be that insurance for – and I have a feeling with, with Isaiah McKenzie, if you put him on the practice squad or try to, another team's going to pick him up. So you you got to kind of play that game as well, and you have to see how people stand out. Sonoris Perry is supposed to be a special team standout, but they might take four running backs, and if they take four running backs, how are we going to cut T.J. Yeldon because of what he brings in all facets of the game? I don't know. There's this is it's a good problem to have. There's so many co- kind of options at different positions. One uh, speaking of running back, somebody in the chat brought up a little while ago a couple of comments. Melvin Gordon. Do we discuss Melvin Gordon? Of course it, we do. It, of it, course it, we do. I got I got I got some thoughts on that. He's got takes on takes. He's ready to go. Got- <laughs> so Melvin Gordon, if you haven't heard, uh, may be entering the trade block because he wants a new contract. Uh, the Buffalo Bills have been uh, discussed as a potential landing spot for Melvin Gordon. Uh, a few assets that they might be willing to move. You think about a Shaq Lawson, maybe even a TJ Yeldon, uh, LaShawn McCoy in the last year of his contract, the familiarity there with uh, Chargers co- coach Anthony Lynn. So the question is two parts. Do you think that Melvin Gordon is a fit and is a guy that you'd like to add to the offense here? Are they close enough? to where you'd want to enter the mix with Melvin Gordon, or or part B, part two, do you want to give up what it's probably going to cost to get him? Um, okay, here's the deal. Melvin Gordon is a special talent. The boy, could, he could play. There's no question about it. Uh, adding a Melvin Gordon to the Bills would essentially get us younger and make us essentially better, because right now he's in coming into the prime of his career, and that's why he's trying to get paid. Right, you gotta get paid. Um, now here's um, here's where I have my differences. Um, you have, and this is how I broke it down. I broke it down: motivation and disgruntled. And some might disagree with me, or might want to know where I'm coming with this. Right. So you have a Lashawn McCoy that damn well knows 
that the last couple of years haven't been where I needed to be, not my standard. So he's got motivation. And when someone's motivated, like a, like a, a Sills, like a, a, uh, a Duke Williams, they're going to bust their ass and show exactly what's really good. The in comes uh, LeSean McCoy. You, you go and ask management, bring my man Gore in. So you're motivated. You need that. You want to show people that you still can play. Not only that, he's playing for his future. And people don't understand what I mean by that. He's playing for his future. Because if he has a down year again, coming into his last year of his contract, I'm not saying it's, he's not going to get picked up, but it's going to be very difficult uh, to, to show other teams that I can still play when you've got now three down years. They're going to tell you, listen, you're, you're, you're that 30-year-old mark, you're showing exactly what's really good. Now, a Melvin Gordon disgruntled. And, and I, I use that because if, and I'm not saying he doesn't love the game or anything of that nature, but you're trying to get paid right now. It's business. So imagine they say, you know what, we're not paying you, but we're going to trade you to Buffalo. My man's going to be upset. He's going to be angry. Um, and, and I'm only speculating here, but not everybody loves <laughs> to be A, traded, or B, sent to a team where you're like, whoa, I'm in Buffalo. So how much love is he going to project when he's there? That's where I come in. So I'll take motivation over someone that's disgruntled. So I'm keeping the core that we have right now instead of making a trade for Gordon. That's where I'm at. What about you, Paul? And I think you have to also consider who you're dealing with in terms of Brandon Bean as a, uh, a general manager. He's a yep. guy, he's a, you know, a, a personnel guy that doesn't like to give up draft capital. He's made that known that he feels like he's going to build the, the foundation of this team, which is still being built. You know, I think that he, he's kind of insinuated that he still needs another draft or two to really put in place the foundation of this team that he wants to build. You, you have a Josh Allen, you have a Devin Singletary, a Tremaine Edmonds, a Tredavious White, uh, you know, but you want to keep building that. And if you're going to give up draft picks to go out and not only get a running back, but then you're going to have to basically break the bank to sign him to a long-term deal. I just don't think that this, the current NFL, that that uh, philosophy or that approach is conducive to winning. And I think that, yeah, would he help in the short term? Of course. But I think that they have enough options. Um, and I think they might even, you know, go away from the way they approached the offensive game plan in 2018. There were games where they were trying to run the ball almost like they were run, running their head against the wall. I think that in this year, you're going to see the running backs used a little bit more in the passing game, a little bit more creativity, creativity on Brian Dable's part. And I think that they believe at least now they have enough to compete. Uh, how competitive they'll be, that remains to be seen. But, yeah, I just – I don't think you empty – Empty the uh, asset bank uh, for one guy in this era, unless it's a game changer like an Antonio Brown, which, you know, he did his due diligence on that as well, and he realized that yep. that wasn't the play also. So, which, now, let's say we, would you take Gordon over McCoy right now? If it was just, who can I have right now? Yes. Yes. Yes, because I think that, um, I have some concerns about the skill level, and I know that Bill fans are going to want to hear this, and I know that LaShawn McCoy would not want to hear this, but you go back and watch, and you, you wonder, when, when you're a guy like LaShawn McCoy, when you've been so good at this thing for so many years, and you maybe lose just a little bit of that quickness and that speed and that drive, and then the hits start to mount a little bit differently than they did when you were younger, because you don't have that same quickness and elusiveness. Now, he still has more quickness and elusiveness than I'd probably say 80 to 90% of the guys in this league. But Absolutely. he was a special, special talent in his prime. And if he's past that prime, I think that you, you lose a dimension. Uh, there were plenty of times last year where there, was, there were holes that he didn't hit quick enough. And it, don't, don't get me wrong. This offensive line was bad last year. I'm not, I'm not saying that things can't be better this year. I think they, they yeah. could. I just think that you know, you're, you're, you're telling me that Melvin Gordon in his prime, even coming off of the injuries and the, the stuff that he struggled with as well, I'd, I'd probably go with Melvin Gordon. Uh, and, and, I, and I appreciate that because I, I was curious about that. And, and you, brought, you brought something up that I'm really interested in finding. Uh, the O-line. You said, well, you know, the O-line wasn't great last year. So now we have a different O-line, sir, Mr. Perino. So talk to me about that. You, you, you cover the team. You see, you're there. So what have you been seeing uh, while you've been out there looking at the guys, looking at how they gel? Who's standing <laughs> up to you? Who's not? 
So first and foremost, I've been very impressed with Mitch Morse and the way that he's immediately kind of stepped into that leadership role amongst the offensive line. He's almost, you know, also taken a piece of the responsibility for the development of Josh Allen, which I think was such a key in signing him to begin with. Uh, I put out the five players who I think are going to have the biggest impact on a potential Bills playoff push. Obviously, Josh yeah. Allen was number one, but I put Mitch, Mitch Morse at number two, and the reason I did that is because he has so many more responsibilities than just stepping on the field and being a good football player. He's responsible for elevating the play of those around him. You look at Deion Dawkins last year without Eric Wood, without Richie Incognito. You saw a different player, a guy take a step back. You need offensive line. I think that's one of the most important areas of, you know, the team-oriented, you know, sport of football where you need all five pieces working in unison. And it's, it's the center's responsibility a lot of times to get guys around him operating at the optimal level. So I'm looking at Mitch Morse. Mm-hmm. I'm, I've liked everything that I've seen so far. Obviously, yeah. he has a history uh, of not being able to stay healthy. Uh, but also Quentin Spain. I think he's been an underrated, not talked about enough addition because of his – abilities as a run blocker I think that we the Bills really struggled on the interior at the guard spots last year opening up holes consistently pushing back defenders and even swinging uh to the other side Wyatt Teller had his moments where he was really good he had some moments where he was really bad as well and he's a fifth round draft pick he's still developing I'm not trying to you know knock the guy but Quentin Spain is graded out as an, you know, at times an elite level run blocker. And I think that that's a big time addition. I like John Feliciano's uh, past history with Bobby Johnson. Oh, hey, by the way, I think you're going to like Bobby Johnson. This guy is engaged. He brings okay. juice. He gets up okay. in guys' faces. We're seeing that already in mini. I saw that rookie mini camp. I'm like, man, this is a big difference from Juan Castillo from a year ago. Oh, so, buddy. I like, the, I like the whole mojo, the whole feeling, the vibe, uh, you know, in that offensive line room. Okay, keep, keep that same energy, sir. Keep that same energy. Give me your five guys that are going to start. Don't play – don't don't try to play the game. Just give me your five. I like that. I like that question. So, Deion Dawkins, left tackle. Quentin so, you're, hold on. You're good with Deion Dawkins at left? I didn't say I'm good with it. I just – I'm just giving you my projection. I'm okay, okay, okay. Go ahead. Go ahead, um, go ahead, go ahead. Which I'm <laughs> – I'm 80% good with it, but we'll get back to that. Deion, right. Daw- Deion Dawkins, left, uh, left tackle. Left guard, Quentin Spain. Center, Mitch Morse. Right guard to start, Spencer Long. Because here's why. I okay. don't <laughs> – Yes, tell you here's why. <laughs> and right tackle, I think it's going to end up being Cody Ford, but it's going to be a battle. I think that's the one I'm most on the fence about because Cody Ford really has to show that he is ready uh, to take on NFL defensive ends on the regular to win that job. And Ty Seke has put some good stuff on tape, albeit at left tackle. And don't forget, this is something that I wasn't really thinking about before I saw it in a pro football focus projection. He played three games at left guard last year. So well, who's to say that Ty Seke doesn't get swung inside at a guard spot? That's very interesting uh, because of his size and physicality. Uh, but I do think that Spencer Long, I li- they like his versatility. And another guy, he played on a really bad Jets offensive line last year. Everybody wants to kind of crap on what he did last year. When you play with bad players in this league, especially yeah. on these units where you have to work together, you're going to play probably not up to your full potential. So they like Spencer Long. I, I, I also think they like John Feliciano, but I'm giving the edge to Long at this juncture. But that Inseke or, or even maybe Cody Ford, I think they want to keep him at right tackle, but there are options. Hmm. Hmm. Left tackle, you were 80% on Mr. Dawkins. 80% on the fact that Ty Seke, you go back and watch what he did against Jadavion Clowney last year, and I'm sitting here thinking, man, you gave that guy that contract for this season to not play him? Now, they could play him at right tackle, but I don't think he'll be as effective. Maybe he will be. Maybe we'll see that in, the, in training camp and in the preseason. But – from everything that I've seen of Deion Dawkins this offseason, I think that this regime wants to give their second-round draft pick from two years ago every opportunity to prove that he has figured it out, he has refocused, and he can do the job at left tackle spot. I asked you this question because it's, it's something that is going to 
everybody's mulling everybody's i i must have switched my 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 tandem multiple times thinking okay i think i got it it's going to be this, this so um going like just reading things and, and seeing what's happening uh on this team right now uh, what i'm sitting here thinking i'm thinking they're going to give Deion Dawkins another opportunity right because like you said when you're not playing when you're playing with lesser talent you have to almost make up for the lesser talent and then your your abilities um suffer so with better talent he's he should play better so if i leave Deion Dawkins left Spain left guard Mitch center here's where i think this would be interesting Laramie Tunsil Dolphins started his career inside he's now moved outside and is one of the top left tackles in the game mm -hmm. so Cody Ford has played inside now before we, we throw him outside to the wolves on the right side not that he can't handle it why not keep him inside put him next to Enseke which is the veteran guy they lean off of each other and with one year's experience move his ass to the right now maybe you put in John Feliciano or you move to a tight second side. It's one of those things that you can play around with. And I'm still probably going to play around with this, with this projection. But I like that projection, having uh, outside right tackle Niseki, a veteran guy that can kind of mentor the inside guy, which is forward. Mitch Morse is right next to him as well. So you're in between two guys that can uh, to, to mentor you on the way there. And you got Spain and, and, uh, and Dawkins. How do you feel about that one? I actually like your, your, your thought process there, and I think that what's so fun about this time of year is we're 10 days away from seeing if any of this kind of tinkering Absolutely. is entering the minds of Brian Dable and Sean McDermott because we're going to see who they throw out there in practice with the first team. It's looking like everybody's going to be healthy. Uh, Mitch Morris, John Feliciano, Spencer Long even. We're dealing with some nagging stuff uh, over the course of OTAs and minicamp, but everybody should be at full health. So you're going to see – um, next Thursday, uh, man, I can't believe it. We're 10 days away. We're, you're going to see what, what kind of combinations they're going to throw out there, not only with the first team, but the second team and so on and so forth. So I think that it's about, no matter who they put out there, it's about figuring out what's the best unit and the most cohesive unit and doing it in a timely manner because they don't have a lot of time to mesh once you get to that second preseason game man it, it's off to the races and josh yeah. allen listen he's made tons of strides and we could talk about him if you guys want to as well i feel like we always talk about josh allen but um you want to get your offensive line in place for josh allen because you want him to be as comfortable as possible he's got all these weapons now uh he's got a a, a couple new running backs a couple new receivers tight end and eh, we'll, we'll we'll fast forward over that we already talked about that but you know i think year two it's about putting him in every position to be successful and that also goes for brian dable how are you game planning to start these games when you go on the road to play the jets and the giants week one and two are you putting josh allen in a, in a position to be successful in that short intermediate passing game where he has shown to have some struggles in the past what kind of plays are you dialing up are you repping it out enough in practice so he goes into the game and these these throws are like second nature to him and so far in minicamp and OTAs they have been banging that drum uh, but I, I I've really maintained that Josh Allen is a rhythm based player and if you can put him in a position where he's making plays early getting confident early in games that's when you're gonna start to see him make these big plays so I love the fact that we are talking about Josh Allen it's a good segue sir well done well done uh, <laughs> Which now you can't talk about Josh Allen without talking about still connected. I'm not sure if we still connected or not. You still here? I'm get I'm getting you okay. now. Can you hear me? Yeah, I, we're good. So you mentioned you mentioned yeah. um, Coach Dable and. Uh, and you mentioned that if he can, like, you're looking forward to how he how he schemes up and puts things on 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 the field uh, for for away games or so. What are your thoughts on Dable going into this year? Last year, it did not start off hot. It did not, and I was extremely critical, extremely critical. Still am a little bit, but I'm back. I've backed off because this is first year with the squad and so on and so forth. We're going into year two now. Now he had a very uh, 
Very uh, promising second half of the season. Started calling plays that were more favorable to Josh Allen and Robert Foster and so on and so forth. Can he keep that up? Or uh, can we expect the same, I mean, the, the frustrating Dable play calls and so on and so forth? Because I'm, I'm still battling with it, but I'm giving him the benefit of the doubt because we have more weapons. So let me throw this at you. How much of Brian Dable's play calling was an extension of Sean McDermott's desire to establish the line of scrimmage? Uh, so, are you going there? I'm going there. So I, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not sitting here say, taking any of the responsibility off of Brian Dable for the play calling. But the philosophy of this team, and every chance Sean McDermott gets to mention it, he does, is he believes, believes everything starts at the line of scrimmage. You build your team uh, from the lines, which I don't have any problem with, and in the game you win by dominating the line of scrimmage, which I can't argue with that as well. But if that's the mindset of your head coach and that's what he's asking you to do and you're running into the back of a terrible offensive line over and over and over again, not to mention some other factors where you have Charles Clay dropping balls, you have a, a very disgruntled Calvin Benjamin that you are just throwing – SH, you know what, at the wall, mm -hmm. trying to figure mm -hmm. out how to get him involved, how to get him engaged and activated. I mean, you go back to one of the highlights of last season, Zay Jones touchdown against the Dolphins over the middle, and you see Kevin yep. Benjamin just kind of chilling off to the side, not even I getting know. Uh, one single you know what. So I know. I think that he was up against a lot of things last year, and I think that now year two for Dable with Josh Allen, a comfort level, a Ken Dorsey now, in the uh, situation, they had a quarterbacks coach last year that had never coached the position, played the position. David Cully, I know. Don't even talk. Listen, don't even get me there. I already know. I know. I know. I know. I'm glad his ass is gone. <laughs> and and I'm I'm and that's why I'm backing off of Dable because there is a, see. And I'm I only laughed at that comment because uh, my man Pierre says you guys don't realize that he feels that. McDermott has more of a hand in how this offense is run than we're, we're, allow, we're, we're knowing. Mm -hmm. So he doesn't feel that pretty much – I'm not saying he's handcuffed, but he feels like Dable is somewhat handcuffed because he's going by what head coach wants him to do. So hopefully the head coach backs off and lets Dable do his thing. That's why I'm kind of saying, okay, I might have to be open to that. Uh, I really hope he does well. Uh, and I, before Dable got signed, I, I read that he was a multiple guy. He likes to move things around and 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 really keep teams guessing. But he didn't give it. He didn't give us that at the beginning of the year. Force feeding Kelvin Bumass Benjamin, biscuit. You know what I'm saying? And and just calling plays that just just it just nuts to me. So I'm hoping for a uh, a very uh, balanced offense this year. I really want Allen to really progress. Ken Dorsey being behind him, he's really talked well of Ken Dorsey from what I've read. Uh, I'm really hoping the chemistry really builds, man, because we, we need this. We can't have Allen take a dip year in the sophomore year. I know it's, it's the thing, but the sophomore slump, we can't have that. We can't afford that. That's just my opinion. What about you? What do you think? I, I like it, and I think that, um, you know, I think there should be some responsibility placed on the shoulders of Brian Dable for how this offense operates, and I'm with you there 100%. I think that he has more playmakers now. I think that he has had a year to assess what went right, what, what went wrong, and now the expectations are execution. If you start the season the first four to seven games of the year, four to six, five, seven games of the year, and you're still 30th in the league in passing, or 31st in the league in passing. There's gonna have you're gonna have to answer for that. And I think that, Absolutely. and I think that um, he has the creative mind, and he spent enough time in this league. I think one of the big problems was he went to New England. This was a, a nice little tidbit uh, that I remembered uh, that or that I learned last year about Brian Dable is when he was interviewing with Brian Dable, he told him that. He took one year off where he went to New England, and he, all he did that whole season, he wasn't a coach. He was basically not, not more than a coordinator, like just like a, an entry-level intern or something, where he basically just spent the year studying Dante Scarnecchia, offensive line play, what works, what doesn't, how does he get across to his guys. And so I'm kind of taking what's happened in this offseason, the guys that they brought in, um, the fact that they went out and got Bobby Johnson, who I'm a fan of so far, in that he learned something from that experience and he's applying that to what's going to work here. 
And so I'm giving him the benefit of the doubt. But like you said, things aren't going well. If Josh Allen isn't figuring it, figuring it out, you have to hold Brian Dable accountable. And, and that's what it comes down to. And I, I don't think it was by chance. I don't think it was uh, out of nowhere that they brought in Ken Dorsey. Think about it. The year before, when they were deciding between who to bring in as offensive coordinator, Ken Dorsey was interviewed for it and didn't get it. Mm-hmm. Dable got it. Or was it the year before? I'm trying to, I don't want to get my years mixed up. But the point is, Ken Dorsey was a, a candidate for the job. And now you bring him in as a quarterback coach. So in my mind, I'm thinking, and I, I'm, I'm pure speculation here, if Dable doesn't get this train going, Ken Dorsey's in the background saying, all right, son, if you don't get this thing going, I'm right here. And, and it's just ironic that he interviewed for the job. So they considered him. So it's just interesting, that dynamic now. And it's, if it's great, both of them are there. Two minds were greater than one. We have a great year from Allen. We'll see. We'll see. We will definitely see. We've been going for about 40 minutes, guys. This has been awesome. i got to get out of here. But I want to do this again soon. This was a, Absolutely. a lot of fun. Uh, I'm going to be up at camp in 10 days. Uh, what's your guys' plan for the season here now? You're going to be hosting uh, – Week three uh, get together. Tailgate. Yes. Yes. We're 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 hosting. Listen, man, it's gonna be uh, it's gonna be epic. Actually, you should show up, my good man. Come in and sit. One hundred percent. Yeah, man. Uh, we're gonna be hosting the uh, the the Buffalo Fanatics tailgate week three. Um, it's gonna be fun, man. Giveaways. We're gonna be doing a whole bunch of stuff. Meet and greet, saying hello. Just it's a community, man. It's a big Bills community. Like you said earlier, there's too much competition and this, that, and the third that goes on. Yo, forget about it, man. We're all part of one squad, one team. We root for the team. Yo, come say what's up. Come say hello. And I expect to see you there, sir. I definitely will get out here. And I, I do have to mention there is a lot of uh, Miami Dolphin salt in the comments right now. I will say that there is. Uh, you, you got quite the following, uh, Mr. Rico, and I, I'm sure that your your lives on here are, are quite adventurous because I've not seen this much. Listen, uh, I have I have really good nonstick pans for Frisch, so uh, I might bring I might you know what I'm actually going to the game against the Dolphins uh, in October, so I'm gonna bring my uh, I'm gonna bring my grill, I'm gonna bring my, uh, my 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 pan that does nonstick, and I'm gonna fry fish all day. That's how we do. <laughs> Such a dolphins, man. Get out of here with that. There you go. Rico, So thank you so much for taking some time to talk today. We'll do it again really soon. Guys, for all of your Buffalo Bills content from us, nyupsyracuse.com, and they are Buffalo Fanatics, give them a follow on all their platforms. They do a great job. Thank you so much for joining me today. Absolutely. I appreciate that, boss. Take care, guys. Take care, man.